What's going on? It's that time. It's Keyshawn, and welcome to my show, Undisputed Presents, All Facts and No Breaks Podcast. Joining me today is the Texas Longhorns head football coach, Steve Sarkeesian. What's up, Sark? Good Key, man. It's great to see you. Good, man. I'm, I'm glad to see you as well. Also, a guy who you recruited joins us on the show every single week, and my son, Keyshawn Johnson Jr. So I don't know if you remember him at Calabasas High School, but there he is, Steve. I love it, man. Well, well this is a little bit of a family reunion, man. This is pretty cool. Not bad at all. Not bad, I would say. No, yeah, I definitely remember getting recruited. Uh, you come into Calabasas High School, getting me a scholarship. It was it was amazing. So, yeah, it's just full circle. It is full circle, man. I, you don't know this. Your dad and I go way back, man. We, we, we were like, shoot, we're <laughs> almost 30-something 30, 30 years into this now, man, of kind of growing up out there together. No, it is. And and when you look at it, I, I tell people, you know, it's a, I got about five really good college football head coaching friends. Now I got to pick and choose, right? I got to pick Texas. I got to pick Ole Miss. I got to pick now UCLA with Deshaun Foster. I got Colorado. So I got to pick and choose, and obviously my alma mater at USC. But I got five college programs that I root for every, that I'm going to be rooting for every single week as long as they don't play USC. So I'm going to make way to Austin, Texas this year, I promise you. I know I've been saying I'm going to get there, but I'm getting there this year. Yeah, you got to come, man. It, it's a, it's a been a, it's a great environment. It, it really is, and it, it's been a, it's been a bit of a journey, right? Three years into this thing, from from where we started um, to to you know finishing up last year the way that we did, being conference champs and and getting to this, the college football playoff. But now it kind of just feels right of the growth of the program and and where we're headed. We've got an awesome game day atmosphere at at, at DKR. Uh, and Austin, the, the city is amazing, man. So I'm sure you'll be here for South by Southwest or something like that in the off season, <laughs> but you got definitely got to get to a game uh, uh, in the fall. Okay. Well, coach, you recently received a major contract extension with the Longhorns. Congratulations on that. Um, on this show, we like to play a game called Facts or Fiction. So front office sports put out some details on your contract, including two cars, private jet use, country club access, and some millions for your troubles. So coach, can you concur if this graphic is facts or fiction, or are you going to plead the fifth? No, that, that's fact. That, that's fine. It's it's public information now, so fact. Oh, well, that, that, that's, a, that's, that's a good deal, cool. Sark. I need that. <laughs> hey, I need that deal. I'm, like my son said, congratulations. I'm happy, you know, obviously – Early in your young coaching career, there was a little bit of turbulence and, and you bounced back with the best of them. I had conversations with you along the way as you became one of the favorite sons in college football as an offensive coordinator at Alabama under Nick Saban. And, and I'm sure you learned a lot under Coach Saban and, and Pete Carroll, obviously, when you were at USC and Norm Child. But then the speculation came this offseason when Nick Saban decided to step down that you was the main focus on having an opportunity to go coach at Alabama. Is there any truth to, at all to those speculations? Did you have any conversations with them at all? Well, let, let me go back. How, how about that? On the same day, uh, my two mentors, um, Pete Carroll, Nick Saban, on the same day, stepped down, right? Uh, which was pretty fascinating. I've only, you know, I've worked for four head coaches in my time, really coaching. When you think about Pete Carroll, Norv Turner, uh, Dan Quinn and and Nick Saban, but the the two most influential guys on my career, and Pete Carroll and Nick Saban, both both stepped down on the same day, which was for me, um, you know, just just pretty amazing. And really for Lane, you know, uh, Lane Kiffin, you know, you know, Key that th those guys were were huge and monumental in my career and 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 growing me into this profession and finding my way and in coach Carroll, giving me my shot and my opportunity and, and growing me in the profession, which led, led me to becoming the head coach of the university of Washington for five years. And then as you touched on resurrecting my career at Alabama with, with coach Saban. And so I can't thank those two men enough for, for what they've done for me and my career and wish them nothing but the best. I hope they're enjoying life now uh, and not doing all the craziness that we're doing. Uh, but, but like, I've told people before, 
when I left, when I left Alabama, um, to, to come to Texas, uh, at the end of that 2020 season, when we won the national championship, um, I came here with the hopes and the goals of building my own legacy. And I think that that's something that obviously coach Saban did at Alabama, coach Carroll did at USC and with the Seahawks. And so, um, you know, I think that the speculation in the outside world was probably just that, uh, we were, we were in the process of, of developing and, and getting my new contract here done. And I think we're just on the cusp of doing some really special things here at the university of Texas. And so, um, you know, I'm fortunate, but, but no, that, that was not, that was not really a reality. Well, you know what though, in, in terms of that, I, I agree with you, Sark, in terms of the reality side. Now, Alabama's a great football supporting state. There's no question about it. But in terms of, I would never leave Texas in Austin to go coach at Alabama and follow Nick Saban. It just doesn't, you know, it's only a handful of programs. And I tell people, and this, and I started telling people this after the Lane situation at Tennessee. People couldn't understand why Lane would leave Tennessee to go to USC. There's only about five college football programs in my as far as I'm concerned, USC, Texas, Notre Dame, and then maybe you Michigan, you throw in there that you in and, and, and there's maybe a Florida state that I would never leave to go coach at another college because it it's it'd be a lateral move. Texas is so big in terms of just their athletic program, the academics, the city, just all of those things, there would be probably no amount of money that a program could, unless I'm going to the NFL, can sway me in college football to leave the University of Texas. It just, you know, it made no sense when the rumors were out there. I was like, nah, he ain't, nah, nah. he would never do that. Well, you know, you know, for me, I, growing up in LA, I like a little city in my life. You yes. know, I, I like a little bit of concrete. I, I don't mind that the I-35 runs, uh, runs just east of campus right here. I love that there's plenty of places downtown to go eat. I love that we have a city of over a million people now in Austin, but I also do love this. I love that in Austin, you know, there's no pro sports, you know, we, you know, Texas, the university of Texas, Texas football, you know, we're really the pro football team in this town. And so we kind of have the best of both worlds. Um, and that's, that's nothing to take away of being in Tuscaloosa, which is, a, you know, a true college town that way, uh, obviously much smaller in, in size, but different than even being in LA where there's so many other things going on in my time there when I was at USC, there's just a really unique niche here at Austin that I think we're, we're really trying to capitalize on and, and trying to do something, like I said, pretty special. Okay. Yeah. So coach with the arrival of Arch Manning joining your program last season, the college football world questioned if there would be a quarterback battle between him and Quinn Ewers. You've already named Quinn the starter for 2024. What excites you most about getting to make one more run with them? Well, I just think this, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit old school on some of this stuff. And I, I, I understand that, you know, in this day and age of recruiting and social media and what's going on, everybody, you know, wants to be the five star and come in right away and have instant impact and things of that nature. Um, but I'm a little bit of the belief of there's a there's a developmental side to our game. Um, so that when you do play, you play great football and that you have longevity in your career, uh, when you do get to the NFL, because you're prepared, uh, for that time when you get there. And I think for Quinn, um, you know, having one more season of, of starting, getting, getting his start number up into the thirties, uh, as a bona fide starter, being a leader of a team, continuing to mature, uh, staying healthy, things of that nature. And I think for Arch, what a great opportunity as a backup now this year in his, in his second season, going to get some definite playing time. And we're looking forward to him doing that, watching his maturation and growth. I think for the, both of these guys, it's going to be the best for them, for their futures, uh, so that they can play the best football. So we're fortunate. Um, you know, I've, I've never not been anywhere. Where we haven't had quarterbacks. And so we're fortunate to have those two guys right now, um, as guys that can go out and lead our offense and lead our team. You know, Sark, you, you've been known to be one of the best recruiters in all of college football, whether it's as an assistant coach or as a head coach, you, you, I like to say you get what you want and when you need it, you get it right. And recently you got Isaiah bond that came over kind of ghosted university of Alabama and decided, Hey, I'm going to commit 
to the University of Texas, and there's rumors floating around. There's NIL deals here and there, and there's a lot of Lamborghinis and things of that nature, and that happens in this space of college sports. What went into closing that deal and getting it done yeah. to get your next big pass catcher? Well, I, I think one thing that that gets missed in a lot of this, you know, we recruited Isaiah out of high school. Uh, he was a kid out of Buford High School in, in Georgia, and we recruited him hard. Um, Key, as you know, we love having those dynamic playmakers, those guys that can possess some speed, um, that that can that can play in space and create explosive plays. And and so we had a previous relationship with him when he initially decided to commit and to, and to go to Alabama. Naturally, you know, as you go through a season, you never know how it's going to go. And and we were in a situation where I had two receivers declare early for the NFL draft uh, in Xavier Worthy uh, and A.D. Mitchell. And both those guys, really good players for us, um, had great games when we played, you know, in Tuscaloosa against Alabama. Uh, and it's a, just timing is pretty incredible that in the midst of all that, Coach Saban decides to decides to retire, uh, and that opens up a 30 day window for all those kids at Alabama to potentially enter the portal. And so when Isaiah went into the portal, hey, we recruited him. Um, the, the moment he went in, I was on a plane and and I and I flew to Georgia and I was in his living room with his mom and his dad, uh, and I started that recruiting process. To your point, you know, I, I think we really try to identify what our needs are. Um, and then we try to we try to recruit those players that fill those needs that that give us the best chance to to be successful. Mm -hmm. So, Coach Sark, my dad was once an all right receiver back in his day. Take a listen to his recruiting process. So when I was being recruited, I went all the way to the SEC from Los Angeles. Yeah. And I was being recruited, and I really wanted to go to this particular school. And get on the plane, I fly some long ways. Damn, this shit's far. So when I got into the final meeting, the exit meeting with the head coach, and I told him, I said, hey, what's holding you back from committing? I said, what's far? What am I going to do? True story. God be my witness. The dude reaches behind the desk, opens up the briefcase, $300,000, $350,000, all cash. Yeah. He said, that's not a problem. <laughs> At all. <laughs> Boom, bam, turned it. You know, I'm looking at him like, so good. You know, so good. I'd be like, great. Yeah. <laughs> Mom but, and dad, bro. But, <laughs> and so, no, so I committed, so but I flew home and that flight was still far for me. Yeah. You know, like, and then I just was like, no. And so when we now go and get a kid from Texas or get a kid from Mississippi, or Alabama, whatever, they don't have to really worry about that with yeah. the NIL in place. Yeah. As long as they are producing at a level in which they can earn a certain amount of money because of the NIL, then they'll be able to have their families fly all over the country to every single game. <laughs> so, Coach, can you speak to what has changed the most about your job since the addition of NIL and the transfer portal? Well, I think just time management is probably the biggest thing, man. You know, we, you know, you're, you're, when you look at it, you, there's this whole recruiting group, if you just want to classify it as that. We've got this whole recruiting side, the high school recruiting kid, which, which we, we, place a lot of value in recruiting those kids. Then there's retention, keeping your own kids on your roster. And when I say that, I don't mean that, man, we're, we're just trying to baby these guys. We, we coach our guys hard, um, but we want them to know that, that we care and that we're trying to develop them to be the, the best players that they can be, uh, become the best men that they can be when they leave our program. And then there's this whole transfer portal now kind of bucket over here that, that you have to tap into um, to kind of fill needs. And we look at the portal like free agency. Uh, if we were an NFL team, mm -hmm. as far as, uh, okay, what are our needs and can we address them through the draft or through recruiting, or do we need to address them throughout through free agency with somebody with a little bit more experience? And so that's kind of our, our process of it, but it's definitely managing your time. Um, because the portal didn't exist before NIL didn't exist before. So that time that, that you spend on that has to come from somewhere else. Uh, and you've got to have great people around you to do that. Um, but, but again, we look at it kind of in three buckets, uh, and then we allocate our, our time, our effort, our resources, our people to those three buckets accordingly. Um, and in the end for me, which, which is a little bit different, I, I'm still calling plays, you know, I'm still very involved in the game planning, 
uh, and calling plays. And so, but the biggest thing that's changed for me is managing my time. Um, and so that, 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 that I'm, I'm, I'm touching all those things, but I'm not so far in, in, in deep into one of them that, that I'm losing sight of something else over here. You know, Sark, the recruiting landscape certainly has changed as you see my story yeah. back there, back when I was playing, what was going on, you know, it was, it was unofficial NIL, so to speak. But you sure. mentioned you mentioned being able to have players to be able to compete. On all due respect to Colorado State, which is your week one opponent, we're going to skip right over that. And we're going to talk about the week two opponent in Michigan. And I know you're a coach, and I know how coaches think that one game at a time, and that's all they really care about to the next opponent. But you got to be, at some point, saying to yourself, how do I keep my team prepared for week two, knowing that this week opponent, week one opponent may not be on the same level as us. Well, here's, here's what I know for us. Okay. And as I'm looking at the whole landscape of the season and then where we're at as a team. Okay. We, we lost some pretty significant players off of last year's team. Um, but we're also returning some, some really good football players. You know, we our whole offensive line is back quarterbacks back. We got two runners. We really like, obviously, we lost three wide receivers, tight end. We lost some some really good players on the defensive line and in the secondary. Um, and so we've we've got to get our team up to speed, right? This team, this is a new team this year. We've got to get these players, you know, ready to play and and committed to play. But also, as you know, in Austin, in in I think that game is August 31st, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's a little bit warm uh, in Austin at that time of year, so it's not like I can just play our front line 22 and think we're going to get through that game. We're going to have to play a lot of bodies, a lot of people, um, which is a good thing uh, because if you look now at the landscape of the new college football playoff, if you want to win a national championship, you're going to play 16 to 17 games, which is which is almost an NFL schedule. And so we're going to need all the bodies on our roster and, and we need to be playing these guys early in the season and not wait till an injury might occur late in the year. So getting all those guys exposure and playing and playing at a high level to the standard that's acceptable here, I think is a really big op uh, proponent of who we want to be throughout the season, but critical to our success early in the year. You played against Washington, your former team in the college football playoffs. Is there, as you unwind, was there anything that you said, you look back at as you went back and watched the film and you said, damn, is there one or two things that you say, I should have done this instead of that? Uh, Michael Penix was pretty good that night. That was the first thing that, that crosses my <laughs> mind. That guy was dropping dimes, man, 40, 50, 60 yards down the field. He had a heck of a game. Um, you know, that the, the thing that's frustrating probably for me is, you know, we, we, we preach the football as, you know, key is, is much or more than anybody. It's all about the ball. And that was instilled in me from coach Carroll, you know, over two decades ago and uh, the ball became a factor. You know, we, we had two turnovers in our first nine plays of the second half. You know, we came out of the locker room at halftime, tie game 21 all. Uh, and next thing you know, we have two turnovers in our first nine plays. And now it's 34 to 21, I think is what it was. And and now we were we were fighting, scratching and clawing to try to get back into the game. Uh, we had an opportunity uh, in the end, you know, with the ball there, I think on the on the 11 or 12 yard line with it with a chance to score. Um, we came up short, you know, and so uh, how do how do we continue to grow as a program to not put ourselves in, and have to be that tight of a situation? But if we are in that tight of a situation that we can execute at a really high level and try to come out on top. And so uh, I think it's a process, you know, a, a little bit of it is I, I look at what Michigan, you know, for for a couple of years there, they were getting to the semis, couldn't get over the hump, weren't playing their quite best football, then they get over the hump and they go win a national championship. And so, um, again, I, I try to look at what other teams have done. I look at, I look at Georgia early on and in, in Kirby's tenure there where they kind of were, were getting there and, and couldn't get over the hump. They get to the national championship game Tua beats them on, on second and 26 or whatever it was, but then they finally got over that hump and, uh, you know, won a couple in a row and obviously have a very good team and a very good program. So, you know, we got there. I think it was great exposure for our guys. Would I've liked to play a little bit better? Sure. Um, but I think it was good exposure and now we know what the standard is and, and that's what we're striving for this off season. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of standard, Texas football is sending a school record 11 players to the NFL scouting combine. 
How does it make you feel as a coach to know Texas is getting that level of NFL attention? Well, I love it. You know, I, um, you know, one thing that I heard and you, you never know why you get hired and what it looks like, but one thing that was a little bit of a knock, you know, or Texas just hadn't was a little bit down for about a decade in there. I was the fourth coach, I think in like seven or eight years. And so it's like, how does that, how is all this happening? You know, what's going on? And, you know, one of the keys was development, right. And, mm -hmm. and developing the players, you know, we always tried to recruit, you know, high level players, but are they made of the right competitive spirit? Um, is the work ethic there? Are we supplying uh, enough support around them to continue to develop them on and off the field? And so it's ironic though, you know, with team success generally comes the individual accolades, awards, and honors, right? So our first year here was a real transition year. It was tough. We went five and seven. We did not have, we had zero players drafted after that season. Mm -hmm. Year two, year two, we go eight and four. Um, we have a pretty good year. We're starting to, we're starting to make some progress. We had five players drafted last year. Mm -hmm. This year you go, you go 12 and two, you win the conference and you're, uh, you go to the college football playoff. Now we have 11 guys going to the NFL combine. We'll see, we'll see how many get drafted. So hopefully, uh, our players are recognizing that you pour into the team, you pour into the team success. Individuals get recognized for the, for the work that they put in. Um, but also that people are recognizing the development side of what we're doing here, uh, whether it's in the weight room, nutrition, um, whether it's mindfulness, whether it's scheme, fundamentals, technique, whatever that looks like, uh, that we're developing some pretty good players on both sides of the ball that that'll have an opportunity to, to fulfill their dreams and further their careers of, of playing in the NFL. You know, Sark, I know you very well, and, and I know you're a little bit of a beach bum, so to speak. You like the water, you like to be by it. I know they got Lake Travis in uh, Austin, but it's not quite the same as the beach. There's the sand, the whole deal. With this newfound richness, I got to ask you a personal question. <laughs> Where are you buying the beach house? Is it Malibu? Oh. Is it Newport Beach? Is it Cabo? It's got to be somewhere. You got to be I, somewhere. In the offseason. season. Man, I, I haven't thought about it yet. I always get I always get concerned about like you you buy that that beach house, then you're kind of stuck. That's where I have to go all the time. I kind of mm -hmm. like moving around a little bit too. You know, Hawaii's a great spot. Cabo's a great spot. Going to LA is a great spot. Going to South Florida is a great spot. Like you know, go to Tampa. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of great beaches out there. So I, I'm gonna kind of. Uh, Try it out, see what's out there, and at some point I'll I'll, I'll figure something out. I'm well, sure. I'm, yeah, no, I I I know you will. But when you do, I need the invitation, man. I enjoyed you. My son enjoyed you. I appreciate you, Longhorn. I'm supporting you in the program as always, man. I wish you the best of luck in this upcoming season. Appreciate y'all, man. Thanks for having me on. Hook All right. Appreciate. It. That's a wrap with Coach Sark today. Thanks again to my boy Steve Sarkeesian joining the show. Don't forget to subscribe and follow All Facts Pod on social media. Until then, it's Keyshawn motherfucking Johnson. I'm out.